Gracious God, humbly we bow our spirits before you this morning in prayer and praise. Praise for you, our amazing God and creator, and in prayer for your people. Words fall short when we attempt to understand the wonders of who you are and the mighty works of your hands, the mysteries that lie before us that you have come and you will come again. But may our lives give glory and honor to you as we obediently reach out to others in your name. We lift up our prayers today for your people, those whom we know well and those whom you place on our hearts to keep in prayer. Lord, we know that in both times of joy and sorrow, you are present with us. Present to rejoice when we celebrate and hold us close when we ache and are in pain. We lift up prayers of healing for our friends who have had to be under a doctor's care this week. And pray for all those who are undergoing cancer treatments and other procedures to restore their health. We lift up Ron Wood, Mel Campbell, and Don Chalstrom as they are cared for in the hospital for various ailments. We pray that their medical teams will use the knowledge you have given them to provide the best medical care they can possibly have. We also pray today for the family of Jim Schmickley, who died this past Monday, and for the family of Mark Chalstrom, who died on Wednesday. Lord, we just ask that you surround these families with your love and strength as they begin that difficult path that so many of us know, which is that path of mourning and sorrow. Be their comfort and guide as we reach out to them along with you, and we reach out to them in love during their journey of grief. We lift up all these things to you this morning, Lord, the prayers that we've shared on the prayer cards that will be prayed over this week, those that have been spoken, and those we pray silently in our hearts. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray together the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As you may know, we are walking through some of the carols of Christ during this Advent season, and it's a privilege and pleasure to be uh, around those and and be with those. I I honestly will tell you, after many, many years of ministry, I don't know if I've ever sang number 236 before, uh, that piece by Handel. Isn't that magnificent? That's just become part of our repertoire, so get used to it. Um, That's that's a fantastic piece of music, and once we learn how to sing that, that's going to be magnificent. Praise not pitch, right? (laughs) Praise not pitch. Yeah. So um, this morning we come uh, to to, to a very short piece of scripture that is going to lead us to to Pastor Keith um, teaching us um, about the deep and rich meanings of the carol that we sing often that we do know very well, uh, entitled, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Hear these words from Micah the prophet, chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, of old, from ancient times. This prophecy points forward to the coming of the advent of Emmanuel, our king. Our pastor comes to share about that. Let's pray for him. Oh God, we ask your blessing on Pastor Keith, that as he speaks today, This meditation might not only have been crafted in his mind or on the computer screen, printed on a page, but that it might have come from somewhere far more eternal than that. Uh, Your very heart, your very mind, transmitted through your Holy Spirit to him. And we ask that he speak it well to us. In Jesus' name, amen. (laughs) 
Good morning. It's great to be with you this morning. As you notice, uh, we got to light another candle here today, the candle of love. So let me just tell you, I love you. (laughs) Doesn't that feel good? Has anybody told you they loved you yet this morning? Well, there you go. No one's told me that yet. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I didn't have the courage to do that at the 745 service. (laughs) I knew you wouldn't let me down. So we're going to talk about O Little Town of Bethlehem this morning. Uh, this is a this is a great old Christmas carol, right? Actually, it's the newest Christmas carol that I think we'll sing. Last week, Pastor Mike talked about uh, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, which dates all the way back to the ninth century. Okay, and and this this hymn comes to us uh, just from a couple hundred years ago, actually, not even that far. It was written in 1867 by a man named Philip Brooks, who was an Episcopal pastor uh, from Philadelphia. And he had been in Israel two years earlier and had celebrated Christmas in Bethlehem. And he came back to his church and wrote this as a poem, really, that was describing the city, not so much as it was when Brooks observed it, but what he imagined in his mind that it might have looked like the night of Jesus' birth. And and he wrote this poem and brought it back with him, and his organist, who was also his Sunday school superintendent or something like that, looked at this poem and and created the the melody for it and the music for it, and they turned it into a, a little song for their children's ministry. And then uh, eventually it became uh, this Christmas carol that's so popular today. And we're going to dig into the words. I know we sang it, but sometimes we can sing things, as Pastor Mike, uh, or sing things that we think we're singing last week, and, and not necessarily hear the, hear the meaning. You know, I, I was going to, to, uh, to say this. Uh, my favorite, my favorite uh, what do you call it, mix-up when you're singing the wrong words. Remember that from last week Pastor Mike was talking about? When you think you're singing the right lyrics to a song, it's the wrong. For me, growing up, it was always when Jimi Hendrix said, Excuse me while I kiss this guy. <clears throat> He thought he was singing while I kissed the sky, but I was always like, why is he singing that? Anyway, 830 service probably doesn't get that reference, but <clears throat> what's that? That's right. You would think so. Okay. All right. Are you ready to read these words again? We already sang them. Let's read them. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep. The silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. O morning stars together proclaim the holy birth and praises sing to God the King and peace to men on earth. How silently... How silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. O come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Now, these songs, uh, or these lyrics, these songs, point us to this city. And and the main idea is really about this song is that it's about this unlikely place where Jesus comes into the world. Now, it's unlikely to us because we have our own ideas, or the world has its own ideas of what should surround the birth of a king and where and how Jesus should appear. However, from God's perspective, it's the only place where Jesus should be born. And as you've seen, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, I saw it up there a second ago. Uh, it, It reads this way, But you, Bethlehem Epiphrah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, there we go, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Now, the word Bethlehem literally means house of bread. 
Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Uh, you know, we come to our, our faith in these lyrics with 2,000 years of church history and the scriptures and, and hearing Jesus' own words declaring himself to be the bread of life, the manna from heaven. <clears throat> and yet, how interesting is it that he was born in a town where the name means house of bread? Now, Bethlehem was a small town. We wouldn't even necessarily call it that. It had a population of around 150, if that, and was very impoverished. We would just, you know, kind of call that a parking lot or something. But, but Bethlehem was, was, was really nothing. And if you look on, on an ancient map, sometimes you wouldn't even see the town of Bethlehem listed. It was so insignificant, so minor, so unlikely for this to be the place where the king would be born. But it was also the birthplace of David. And David, if you remember stories about young King David, David also was small and unlikely. I'm, I'm reminded of the, the, the time in the scripture where David was lined up with his brothers and the king would be chosen and no one considered David. They didn't even call him in. He was a shepherd boy out tending his flocks. <clears throat> but God says that he looks not upon the human appearances, but upon the heart. So this birthplace of David... It would become the birthplace of Jesus, regardless of how small and insignificant it might appear to the world. So four main ideas I want to share with you about this Christmas carol as according to its words. And the first one is this, as we notice that Jesus enters a dark world in relative silence. <clears throat> Jesus does not need the world's approval or celebration for his coming, because Jesus has the approval and celebration of the angels in heaven. But in fact, the Gospel of John tells us that the world did not accept Jesus because they loved this darkness rather than light. And this was true when Jesus was born, and it's still true today. The world will not cheer your decision to follow Jesus. I'm always uh, you know, surprised when I talk to Christians or new Christians, sometimes are surprised when when they want to share with their, the world their newfound faith in Christ or their family or whatever, only to be told, oh, well, that's just a phase. I mean, I work with students all the time who who share their faith with with maybe their parents who don't attend church or their friends who don't support that. And you'd think that you could see a person whose life goes from from, you know, a life of sin and, 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 and hurt to a life of love and, and, and grace and peace. But recognize the world loves its darkness rather than light. Most people didn't notice when Jesus came into the world on the first Christmas. And the truth is, most people won't notice Jesus this Christmas either. <clears throat> notice the theme of this song is that God does all of this while humanity is sleeping. I think he does that on purpose so that we can recognize the fact that <clears throat> oftentimes God does his best work without us. You see, it's all God, isn't it? God never sleeps. God never gets tired. God never grows weary. And the scripture tells us that it's in our weakness that God is made strong. It's all God. Secondly, God has come, Jesus has come to bring everlasting light. Now, but hold on, let me back up for a second here. Now, just because I said he does all this while we're sleeping doesn't mean that anybody gets to sleep in here right now. <clears throat> so just wake yourself up a little bit. We're going to keep going here. Jesus has come to bring everlasting light. The Word became flesh, as we see in the prologue of John's Gospel. My dad preached about that. Pastor Mike talked about that. And I'm going to share with you some scripture from that also this morning, because it talks about this light that has come to be with us. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. <clears throat> you see, Jesus is the true light that gives light to everyone and he was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him, probably because it was asleep. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him, probably because even his own fall asleep. Yet to all who did receive him, 
To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children not born of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but a born of God. You see, Jesus is the light. And if you find yourself in darkness, recognize that in the same way that light reveals truth, Jesus reveals truth. In the same way that light guides us, Jesus guides us. And in the same way that light comforts us, Jesus comforts us. Now, I'm going to make a confession to you this morning. <clears throat> but when, I was, uh, when I was a little boy and actually on up into probably high school, I slept with a nightlight. <clears throat> it's okay. Anybody else sleep with a nightlight? <clears throat> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, let me tell you something, Mike. <clears throat> Here's why I slept with the nightlight. Because for some reason that I don't yet understand, my parents put me in a bedroom in my house that had no windows and was far removed from everyone else in the house. Now, I don't know why they did that. <clears throat> To which Mike replied at the 745 service, we do. <laughs> it could have had something to do with the heavy metal music. It could have had something to do with the drum set. It could have had something to do with my friends who bring their guitars over and all, all, the, all the craziness that would happen. I don't know. But there I was in this room that was kind of more like the attic with no windows, no natural light, no nothing. And at night, when, when you, you know, turn the lights off, even in the daytime for that matter, you turn the lights off, it was pitch black, the kind of black that you can't see your hand in front of your face. And that's a little scary. <laughs> I don't have a problem admitting that. So the little nightlight goes in the room and it just shoots out enough light. But you know what's amazing is when you first turn that thing on, it, it, you still can't see very far, right? But the longer you're exposed to that light, the more you can see. When the light first goes on, you, can, you still can't see your hand in front of your face. You just see a silhouette. But after, you know, 15, 20 minutes, you could almost read a book by that light. Isn't it, Isn't it true that way? How our eyes become adjusted to that light. You see, there's something about light that brings us comfort. And the longer we're in that light... The more comfort it brings, the more truth it reveals, the more it allows us to see. You see, and that's the way Jesus is. He comes with that light for us. He himself is that light. And oftentimes we can just barely get a glimpse of it and it just a little bit shines. But the longer that we stay in that light, the more we can see. The more comfort is brought to us and the more we're guided You know, there's a reason why nightlights aren't run on batteries. It's because if they did, while you were sleeping, maybe the power would begin to dim a little bit. And then when you woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning to go do whatever you had to go do, you'd still be in darkness. You see, a nightlight's plugged into an outlet. And as long as it remains plugged into that outlet, it will shine perpetually. It will never go out. And any time you need it, No matter what time you awaken in the darkness, it is there lighting the way for you. It's in the same way that Jesus Christ never gets tired. His light never dims. His light never runs out because he doesn't run on batteries either. Some of us are running on batteries, aren't we? We get with Jesus for a little bit. We get charged up. We can see a little bit. We take that light. We go out. But then what happens? We sort of get run low. We dim out. Jesus says, stay in my light, and he'll comfort us. The third thing is this, that whoever will cry out to Jesus will be received. Where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. A meek soul is what you need. Jesus said that the meek shall inherit the earth. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means this. It means that you recognize that God did all this. While you were sleeping. It means that you recognize that you had nothing to do 
with what Jesus has done in your life, that you had nothing to do with him coming into the world. He didn't look at you and say, wow, you deserve it. All the great things. I'm going to come to you. He looked at us while we were asleep, while we offered nothing, while we were still in our sin. He came to Bethlehem. He enters into this world in darkness to bring this everlasting light. And what this song declares that we should believe as we sing is that this light is for everyone. There's no one who it will not shine upon. Whomever it would look, whoever would look toward Jesus will be received. Whoever comes to me, Jesus said, I will not cast aside. Now, I've quoted Tim Keller many times, and I'm going to do so again this morning. In one of his sermons, he says these words. He says, you're never closer to the kingdom of God than when you don't believe you deserve to be there. When you don't feel worthy to be there, you're never closer to it than that moment. But it's when you feel like that's just what you deserve, that you're farthest from it. When you feel like that that you've done enough to earn God's love or God's grace or God's mercy or God's light, then then Keller says and the scripture says that, that you're far from it. But when you have meekness in your heart, Jesus enters in. A meek spirit says, Lord, I don't deserve you. But say the word, and I'll follow you. A meek soul says, God, who am I? Who am I? Jesus says, if you come to me, I'll be with you. I'll be your Emmanuel. The fourth thing I want to share with you is this. He comes to be all of our God with us. He comes to be our Emmanuel, and that's for everyone you know, I met with a guy a few a few weeks back who's knocking on uh, knocking on 60 years old and and doesn't know that much about Jesus, despite the fact that he grew up in the church and raised his family in the church and should know everything. And he he confessed to me, I, I, I'm embarrassed because I don't know anything about the Bible or God or Jesus. <laughs> I invited him to come to our, our basic Bible class. And he, he said, oh, I can't do that because what if people would judge me because of what I don't know? And I said, nobody goes to a class because of what they do know. You see, but at the end of that meeting, he, kne- he kneeled down in my office and we prayed for him to receive Christ, his God, Emmanuel. But first I had to convince him that God wanted to be with him. First I had to convince him that even though he'd made mistakes, as if all of us haven't, even though he was asleep spiritually for most of his life, as if all of us haven't been, that God still wanted something to do with him, that God wanted to be his Emmanuel. What does that mean to you? Yesterday I, I did a funeral for, for this, this guy, Mark Charlstrom, who I'd never met before. A guy from Marion, 52 or 53 years old. Some of you might have known Mark. And I, and I, I got up to, to give this message, and it's, it's always interesting to, to do a funeral for someone you've never met or to, to try to comfort people that you've never met before. <coughs> and, and this idea of Emmanuel had been rattling around in my head from because of Mike's sermon last week and because of preparing for this one this week. And I thought to myself, there's a perfect, a perfect psalm of, uh, for this moment. And it's one that we've read a million times. I read, I read to them the 23rd Psalm, and there's an interesting thing about the 23rd Psalm is that it reveals to us that in our moments of greatest darkness, in our moments where death confronts us, that, that God is not far off, that he is with us. Because you notice in, in the point of the psalm where it gets to the part about the valley of the shadow of death, he says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. He moves from talking about the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, all that stuff about God, to now he says, you are with me. He begins to talk about this God who is with him. He moves from talking about God to talking to God. Did you notice that shift in this song too? Did you notice that shift in a little town of Bethlehem where the last lines of the song read, O come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. See, this moves from being a Christmas carol to being a prayer. It's an invitation to, For the Lord Jesus to enter into your life. 
It's a declaration of the truth of the gospel that while the world was sleeping, Jesus came into the world as the light. And whoever would live in this light, Jesus will come and cast out your sin and enter in. And when he enters, he stays. He walks with you through your life. He never grows weary. He never tires. He never flickers. He never fades out. As you sing that song and these songs, I hope that you are believing what you sing and singing what you believe. So ask yourself, what does it mean for you to believe those words today? Have you been asleep? Have you let your life go by? Have you lived in in relative darkness, just kind of stumbling through, trying to figure things out, trying to figure out how to survive this or how to get through that or how to make it and, and do whatever you're trying to do in this life, but with no real sense of purpose or direction? Do you need some comfort in your life? Do you need the truth to be revealed to you? Then then go no further than this little house of bread. Where are we today? We are in a house of bread. And as we celebrate communion, we remember another house of bread, don't we? And it's a house of bread that we're all invited into. Just in the same way that as meek souls receive the Lord, He abides in us today. So we're going to take communion. And I want to be mindful That just as Jesus came into this unlikely place in Bethlehem, he came to another unlikely place for his great feast as the king of kings. Not in a palace or a castle, but in a borrowed upper room in Jerusalem. And it was there in that house of bread that he took bread with his disciples. and He gave thanks to God and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And he gave it to them to eat. He invited them to participate in what he was doing. And in the same way, after the supper was ended, he took the cup. And he gave thanks to his Father in heaven. And he said, take and drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. shed for the forgiveness of sins. And then he invited all of them to drink from it. It's interesting, later, what does he find the disciples doing in the garden? While he's keeping watch, staying awake all night, what are they doing? They're sleeping. Are you sleeping? Are you aware of what God is ready to do in your life? Are you ready to let the light shine into your darkness? Are you ready to say to the Lord today, come to us, abide with us, my body broken for you, our Lord Emmanuel. As you come today, believe that. Next time you sing it, sing it with all your heart, remembering, like Mike said, pitch not praise. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, We thank you for coming into this world, Lord, in the way that you saw fit. For coming into our darkness that we might be able to see you and see ourselves. Lord, wake us up that we might receive you in. Be our God, our Emmanuel. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.